Thank you, Madam Chairman, leading friends. Uh, I'm very honoured to have a chance to say a few words here about the uh, year 7 treaty. Uh, I've been a long involvement myself in the Eurocritical movement going back uh, well, over 40 years. Uh, and I'm opposed to it on democratic and international grounds and have had the pleasure of being to Denmark several times before. Perhaps I would say just a few brief words of background to the to the uh, ESM Treaty. As you know, the political developments uh, between France and Germany have been crucial to the development of the EU. Yeah. The myth of origin of the EU is that it was a peace project between wars between France and Germany. As many of you know, the first step towards supranational integration way back in 1950, the coal and steel community, was to reconcile France to German rearmament in the context of the establishment of NATO in 1949-50. And the second major political development in, 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 in the development of the European integration process, the single currency, was to reconcile France to German reunification in 1989-90, after the collapse of Eastern Europe and the reunification of Germany. So politics has dominated the, the single currency project from the start. It's an essentially a political project using economic means that are totally unsuited for it. Now, when the Treaty of Maastricht, as you know, adopted in 1992, that sets out the rules of the single currency, the monetary union. Well, the monetary union, the currencies weren't locked together until 1999. And then, of course, the euro became uh, the common currency of use uh, from 2000-2001 on uh, among the 17 states that now use the euro, uh, with 10, of course, uh, EU member states that don't use it. But when the euro was set up, there were rules set out as to how it should work. And the basic rules, as many of you know, were the 3% and 60% rules, namely that member states that use the euro, governments, shouldn't have deficits in their uh, annual accounts of more than 3% of their GDP. In other words, that if a government, the government should not spend uh, more than they raise in taxation by more than 3% of their GDP. That was the basic rule to prevent big deficits in public accounts. And the second rule was that uh, member states of the Eurozone should have national debts or governmental debts of around 60% of GDP and not significantly greater than that. Those are the two rules of the, of the euro currency. And there was a system set up to enforce those rules that if, if countries didn't abide by them, that they could be warned by the commission, they, 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 then they might be required to, to put money aside, which they couldn't use uh, as special deposits. And finally, if that didn't work to get them to keep to the 3% and 60% rules, that they would actually have fines imposed upon them, quite heavy fines as a proportion of their GDP. That was the system set up to enforce the, the rules, uh, because of course Germany had abandoned its, uh, its the Deutschmark and was very concerned that, um, that uh, the member states of the Eurozone should abide by the rules. But those rules, of course, were, were not obeyed. They were, not, they were widely broken. And uh, while there were some threats to enforce uh, the 3% rule against Ireland and Portugal way back in the early 2000s, uh, when Germany and France themselves broke the rules in 2003, the 3% deficit rule was broken for several years in succession by both Germany and France in 2003 2004, uh, there was no question of imposing fines on France and Germany, and so the rules were abandoned for everybody. And I suggest to you that if those rules had been kept, and states had not run deficits of more than 3% of the GDP, we wouldn't have got into the crisis that we have got. But of course, what's happened is that the states uh, didn't enforce the rules. Uh, the 60% rule uh, shows how absurd it is. Italy's GDP, Italy's debt is now 120% of Italy's GDP, twice the 60% uh, level. In the Republic of Ireland, our national debt is about 100% of GDP. Uh, and uh, it's well over 60% everywhere else, even in Germany, I think it's about 80% of GDP. So the rules are widely, widely uh, broken, and that is why you might say, that, that's one of the reasons at any rate, why the uh, Eurozone crisis has got, uh, got to where, where it is. Now, it was in the context of the 3% and 60% rules being enforced that the, 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 the Article 125 of the EU treaties was adopted, whereby uh, there would be no bailouts, no bailout rule. 
Article 125 of the, of the second treaty, treaty on, on, on the functioning of the European Union, forbids bailouts whereby, whereby um, the European Central Bank or on any other body would lend to, to governments because governments were supposed to keep to the 3% rule uh, enforced by fines, etc. But uh, in, that, in that context, it was logical to have a ban on bailouts. But then, of course, the rules weren't, weren't enforced. And so the ban on bailout rule, the, the, the Article 125, which bans bailouts, um, is still in the treaties. So the question arose in the context of the recent financial crisis, the fact that Greece and Portugal and Ireland, and, uh, with the property bubble bursting and the government deficits soaring, uh, and, and government revenues falling and government expenditure rising, the deficits got wider and wider, the national debts got bigger and bigger. And it was in that context that the, uh, that the question arose how to get around the ban on bailouts, the Article 125 TFEU ban on bailouts. And that's essentially the purpose of the ESM Treaty, to find, to find a way of breaking the basic rule, uh, getting around, or finding a way around the, the ban on bailouts in the main EU treaties. And that is what has given rise to the two most recent developments, the fiscal, the fiscal treaty and the fiscal compact, which was referred to uh, earlier, which is essentially, I think, a gesture which Germany insisted on uh, for the, for, in order to, to please the, Mrs. Merkel's voters. Because about two or three years ago, the Germans themselves agreed to change their constitution uh, to, uh, to enforce a balanced budget. Uh, that was done two years ago. Uh, two-thirds of the German parliament, Bundestag and Bundesrat, uh, agreed to change the constitution. They don't need a referendum to do that in Germany. And um, they, they agreed that, that uh, future German governments wouldn't run uh, deficits of more than um, a third, I think, uh, about three, five, I think, percent, uh, one percent of GDP from 2016. It hasn't yet come to force that, but from, from 2016. And the Germans had already agreed to do that. And so in order to, uh, to, to so to speak, uh, satisfy the German voters that, uh, that things be run more carefully from now on, I think the German government insisted on this so-called fiscal compact because uh, as, as when, when Germany did, did push this about, about a year ago, uh, the Spanish and, uh, and French government said to, uh, virtually immediately, we will change our constitutions in order to enforce this uh, similar, uh, similar um, uh, balanced budget provision uh, and uh, all um, EU states uh, with the exception of, of, of Britain and the United Kingdom of the Czech Republic uh, has agreed, have agreed to do that. But side by side that, that then there's the, 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 the ESM treaty. Well of course Greece got into a terrible mess uh, last year, the year before, 2010, 2011 and it was in that context that, um, that they agreed uh, for the, on the temporary bailout fund to, to lend money to Greece uh, uh, on a temporary three-year basis, and that was done uh, in, in, Jan in, in uh, spring last year. Uh, uh, large sums of money were contributed by the various other EU governments to lend uh, to, 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 to the Greeks. And the first Greek bailout has been followed by a second one since. And that was the temporary fund, the EFSF, the European Stability, Financial Stabilization Fund, so-called, which was meant just for three years to cease uh, from, from 2010 to, until 2013. So that was going to come to an end next year. And its legal basis was very doubtful because it was set up uh, under a special provision of the EU treaty allowing uh, states to help one another uh, out in times of crisis uh, due to natural disasters and so on, uh, and not due to uh, governments running deficits because of uh, spending more than, they, uh, more than they raise in taxation. So the legal basis of that was always very dubious from the start. In any case, it was only for a three-year fund. So uh, the uh, Eurozone state said we want to get a permanent fund uh, which will take things up from 2013 when the temporary three-year fund runs out. And of course the temporary three-year fund originally set up to, to provide money for, to, to, meet, uh, to help Greece because Greece was unable to borrow sufficient money to meet its deficits from the private market, from, from private investment funds. People were less and less willing to, to lend to the Greek government except at very high, high interest rates. Uh, and that became too expensive for the Greek government to meet, and so they, they, they instituted the special temporary bailout fund. And it was later extended to Ireland, my own state, the Republic of Ireland, the, my, the state where uh, I, I live in, uh, uh, over a year ago. Uh, 
and, um, and, and subsequently to Portugal. So these three states are in, in recipient receipt of, of bailout money from the, from the temporary fund, the EFSF, ESFS. And, um, and of course, one of the conditions of getting that money is that you, you put yourself under strict control by, uh, by uh, the Troika, uh, representatives of the European Central Bank, the European Commission and the IMF to send uh, every three months on uh, Greece and Ireland and Portugal and uh, uh, all government proposals are to be vetted by the Tariq and they have an intimate say in everything that's done. Uh, and um, these states, of course, are not now uh, borrowing from the, from the private market. They're, they're, they're getting the money from this temporary bailout fund. So the permanent bailout fund was agreed last February, the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism. And the basis of it, as I, as I suggested, is, is to try and find a way around the ban on bailouts in the main EU treaties. But in order to, uh, to implement the European, this permanent uh, bailout fund, the European Stability Mechanism, uh, the member states of the Eurozone agreed in March, uh, uh, March last year, March 2011, to amend the EU treaties to allow the setting up of a stability mechanism, so-called, for the Eurozone. Uh, a two-sentence amendment was agreed uh, to, the, um, to the EU treaties, to Article 136 of the EU treaties, saying basically the member states of the Eurozone may set up uh, a stability mechanism if needed to safeguard the stability of the Euro area as a whole, of the, the, the 17 member states using the Eurozone. The member states of the Eurozone may, may, may do that, but they got permission, so to speak, from all 27 to do that for the 17. Uh, and that, that was the legal basis for the ESM treaty. Paradoxically, even though this decision was taken by the, um, uh, by the EU uh, heads of state and government, the European Council of all 27 states, in March last year, this decision only comes into legal force next January. Uh, so the ESM, the permission by the 27 to set up the ESM treaty and to establish a stability mechanism for the Eurozone, it doesn't come to legal force next January, even though the Eurozone states uh, agreed earlier this year that they would try and have the ESM established by July. That, of course, had been delayed by the uh, German Constitutional Court challenge and by the Irish Court challenge, and uh, the ESM uh, hasn't yet come into force. So the last I heard was that they hoped to bring it into force in, in October, and by next month because the ESM treaty says that it may come into force once the member states of the Eurozone contributing 90% of the fund uh, have done so. Because the ESM is a loan fund. It's a fund of money uh, to which all the member states of the Eurozone make contributions, basically in accordance in proportion to their GDP. In the case of Germany, the government constitution court has just laid down that Germany's max contribution would be a maximum of 190 billion. In the case of the Republic of Ireland, or we must contribute 1.3 billion initial capital up to nine and an extra nine billion if called upon uh, to, to provide loans to, to, to countries that need bailouts down the road. So countries contribute as, as initial capital fund and then they're open to having extra sums called upon up to a maximum limit. Though the treaty allows this uh, limit to be raised down the road by the Board of Governors uh, in, in, into the future. So it's a big fund of money um, uh, to which the member states of the Eurozone are all required to contribute. Uh, and, um, uh, and it's meant to, to, to provide uh, money to governments that have got into a situation where the private markets won't lend to them or let, will only lend to them at, at very high rates of interest. In other words, to, 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 to bail them out. Uh, even though, as I said, the EU treaties themselves ban bailouts. So, but they got permission to set up this fund by amending the, um, the Article 136, even though, paradoxically, the, the legal, uh, the, that, that permission only comes into force next January, and they want to get, want, want to get the fund established possibly before, before then. And uh, as I understand it, uh, um, the, as I said, the, the ESF treaty can come into force once the member states of the Eurozone, contributing 90% of the capital, have done that. And we walked, if you actually said, work out the sums, half of the member states, in fact, eight of the 17 member states of the Eurozone, the eight larger states, Germany, France, Italy, and so on, who are the largest member states that use the Euro, uh, contribute 90% of the capital. Uh, and 10% of the capital is contributed by the nine smaller states. 
So paradoxically, a minority of the 17 states, eight of the 17, can bring the Euro's ESL treaty into force, into ratify it, complete the ratification process, once they've contributed 90% uh, of the fund. And, and that can be done by the eight biggest states. And once Germany has made its contribution, uh, the ESM uh, is up and running legally and can come into force, even though the basic permission to, to establish it hasn't, won't come into force until next January. So, so there's kind of a legal question mark over that which was raised in this constitutional case in Ireland. So uh, the, the uh, ESM treaty, the European Civilian Mechanism Treaty, setting up this permanent bailout fund for the Eurozone was a challenge in both, in both uh, Germany and in, in Ireland. Sarkozy said, President Sarkozy, before Hollande's predecessor, said last November, uh, in a very interesting comment at one of his, one of his crisis meetings, he said um, the EU is getting very big, it's, going, it's currently 27 member states, if Croatia joins it, there'll be 28, then Montenegro and Serbia and various other Balkan states will go from 30, 31, 32. And it's not possible, he says, to have, so, to have full integration at the level of a 27, 30, 32, 33 member EU. What we need, said Sarkozy, and I quote him uh, exactly, what we, what we need is a federation for the Eurozone, a confederation for the rest of the EU. A federation for the Eurozone, that is for the inner group of now currently 17 member states that use the Euro, and a confederation, a looser, more equal arrangement between states for the rest of the EU. This was, this was the way Sarkozy put it in a, in a speech last uh, November, which Merkel shortly after echoed more or less the same, rather similar, in some, some rather similar terms. So that's why uh, one of the speakers earlier on said, we're now moving towards a, uh, a two-state EU, I think our Danish friend, uh, and, and it looks very much like that, that the pressures towards European integration have shifted from the 20, all 27 towards the Eurozone. And that's why the ESF Treaty is the first major step in that direction. And there's talk of following it with a banking union, whereby control over the banks. Well, now, there's a big question, would that be for all 27 states or, or for 17? I can't see the British agreeing to a full banking union of you know, the Czech Republic and various other member states. So I suspect that these proposals for a banking union will be for the 17 member states of the Eurozone, rather than for the 27 members of the EU as a whole. And, and also the talk about fiscal unions, tax and spending unions, and so on, and ultimately political union, which of course is what they fundamentally want, or the uh, Eurocrats want, uh, may well be pushed at the level of the Eurozone rather than the EU as a whole. And the ESM treaty is the first treaty, as I said, just for the Eurozone. And there's, uh, I mean, it's widely recognized by people who look at it objectively that the thing is fundamentally legally flawed. It was challenged under the constitutions of Germany and Ireland. The German um, Constitutional Court, as mentioned earlier, said it's okay in accordance with the Constitution of Germany, as long as there's a, a maximum of 190 billion that can be contributed without, before, without going back to the Bundestag. In Ireland, it was challenged by Mr. Thomas Pringle, who's a member, an independent member of the Irish Parliament. He doesn't belong to any party, he's an independent. A close colleague of ours who felt very concerned that this is a new stage in European integration, a shift of integration to the Eurozone from the EU as a whole, and, to, uh, and the idea that our state, uh, which is already in a bailout program, which is very harsh, and the Irish economy is flat in its back, with 15% unemployment and heavy emigration, if it were not for the emigration, we'd have 20% we'd have unemployment, and with one in 10 mortgages three months in arrears, and with the domestic economy, uh, you, you know, flatten his back, as I said, um, with the banks not lending and so on. The, the manufacturing export sector in our state is not doing not too badly, but we're in deep crisis and the Eurozone is, uh, we've got a, a near, near 9 or 10% deficit of GDP deficit in our national budget and the pressures are on from the Troika to narrow the deficit and to cut, cut, cut uh, public spending and, um, and um, raise taxes and cut spending. Uh, and uh, uh, by various targets the next few years. So, so we're in that position, and yet we're expected to contribute 1.3 billion towards the basic down payment to the ESM fund to be followed, if called upon, by up to nine extra billion, um, if called upon to help out the Spaniards or the Italians and whoever is going to be lined up to receive money from the, from the permanent bailout fund. Because as you know, the contagion, bank crisis has now shifted from Greece, from Ireland, from Portugal, 
to Spain. Because Spain had a huge property bubble as well. The banks, lots of banks are bust. The government's run up a huge deficit. Uh, and the private markets are proving more and more reluctant to lend to Spain, except at high interest rates. And that is why Spain is expected to be the next, uh, the, the, the first major applicant to the permanent fund. Well, there's still a bit of money left in the in the temporary fund, but that runs out next year. So the, the two funds will merge together in, in practice. But that's why they really need the ESM as soon as possible, uh, with uh, up to 500 billion uh, in it for lending to Spain and, and possibly Italy down the road. If that, but there's big question marks over whether, whether the sums of money will will, will be adequate. So um, Mr. Pringle, this independent member of the Irish Parliament, uh, took a legal challenge. Uh, last June uh, in the High Court and then I went in, into the uh, Supreme Court in July on two bases. One, he was contending that the ESM Treaty was unconstitutional under the Irish Constitution because it entailed a surrender of sovereignty. It's been well established for a long time that any surrender of sovereignty, that is ultimate lawmaking, judicial and executive power by the Irish state to the EU institutions must be approved by the Irish people in a referendum. That's why we have periodic referendums to allow that. But the question was, was, was this necessary in this case? The requirement to contribute 1.3 billion as a down payment, followed by nine extra billion if needed down the road, was that a restraint on either sovereignty? Well, uh, unfortunately, Mr. Pringle didn't win his case in the, in the, uh, on, on the question of the unconstitutionality in Ireland. To be frank, the Irish uh, Supreme Court was, ran away from the case. They were very much afraid. We are, of course, in a mess. Uh, it was not. It was not exactly the most popular thing, perhaps, to be raised the question of whether whether Ireland should be denied access to to this permanent bailout fund down the road. We are, we are already covered by the existing fund, so and the government says we're going to be back to the private bond markets next year anyway because we're doing well. Well, there's big question marks over that. So the the judges, all seven judges of the Irish Supreme Court, just more or less didn't didn't hear the case. Very, you know, they, they spent two, one and a half days in it. And then they said, oh, no, 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 certainly. Anyway, they said, under oh, the Irish Constitution, it's OK. But uh, the Pringle case um, also challenges legality under EU law. He said that the, he contends and holds that, that his lawyers are holding that the, um, the ESM treaty is, is, is in breach of the EU treaties, particularly of the no, of the ban on bailouts clause, uh, Article 125. Also, there are other uh, articles. Uh, the um, monetary policy for the euro area is, a, is an exclusive competence of the EU as a whole under, under the EU treaties. How then can, um, can uh, uh, the ESM treaty allow uh, measures to be taken which will impinge on monetary policy uh, with just 17? Uh, when when uh, it's exclusive competence of the EU as a whole, the, the, the whole question of, uh, of the running of the, uh, of the Eurozone, that's another issue. But the most important issue, which is a, a legal issue under the EU treaties, is whether how to reconcile the ESM treaty with the ban on bailouts provision in the main EU treaties. Well, the judge in the, the, judge in the High Court in the Pringle case said she was, was a woman, uh, Ms. Mary Lefoy, um, a single judge uh, in, the, in the High Court, or seven judges in the Supreme Court, but the judge in the High Court said she was really puzzled by the paradox that the legal permission to set up a stability mechanism for the Euro area didn't come into force until next January, and yet the Eurozone countries, the 17 member Eurozone governments, wanted to set up the ESM last July and as soon as possible. So what's the connection? Do they really need permission from the, from the EU, from the R27? Does the 27, do the 17 member states of the Eurozone need permission from the 27 to set up the civility mechanism? That's the puzzle for the High Court judge. So she, she said, I'd like to get the opinion of the European Court just on this matter. And, that, and the Supreme Court went along with that and agreed to add in two other questions. So there are three issues which have been put by the Irish Supreme Court before the EU Court of Justice. As I said, the Irish Supreme Court decided that the ESM Treaty was not unconstitutional, was constitutional, in other words, in the body of Ireland, but there were three questions regarding whether it was legal under European Union law, which the Supreme Court has referred to the EU Court of Justice. This is the normal process. If a national Supreme Court is unsure or uncertain about an issue of EU law, it doesn't decide itself because national Supreme Courts are no longer supreme. Uh, they're under the European Court of Justice, which is the Supreme Court in, in effect, 
for, for, the, for the EU as a whole and which adjudicates on, on these issues. But these three questions have been sent by the Irish Supreme Court to the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg and uh, submissions on them had to be in by September the 13th, that's uh, 10 days ago or so. And there will be an oral hearing before the judges of the EU Court of Justice in Luxembourg on the 23rd of October. That's just a month in a month's time. Unfortunately, this issue has got virtually no publicity anywhere around Europe. Uh, far more attention was paid to the German Constitution Court, uh, even though the German, German, German Court has never in its life referred anything to the European Court of Justice. Mm -hmm. but, um, but these quite important referrals are, are, have been made to the European Court of Justice by the Irish Supreme Court. Now, of course, traditionally people regard the Irish Supreme Court as just a rubber stamp for the Brussels Commission. The, 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 the EU Court of Justice has traditionally been regarded as one of the uh, one of the motors of European integration. In decision after decision, it's 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 pushed further integration. But in a sense, this is a very these are very nutty issues. The, the three questions are basically: Is the ESM treaty compatible with the EU treaties? Is it legal under EU law? In other, and is it, does it breach the ban on bailouts provision? How can you reconcile the ban on bailout provision in the EU treaties, the Article 125 um, TFEU, uh, on the one hand, with uh, 17 member states of the Eurozone setting up a special fund to uh, implement bailouts? How is that reconcilable? We have a ban on something here, so now to get around, you set up a, a different entity uh, to, to breach that article. So that's the first question, is, uh, is the ESM treaty legal under EU law, or does it breach various provisions of the EU treaties, the ban on bailouts provision, or the Article 3 provision which makes um, uh, monetary policy for the euro area an exclusive competence of the EU as a whole, and not just of the euro area. And there's a number of other uh, articles which are, are, are at issue. So that's the first question. The second question is, um, is whether the, the, the valid or legal mode of amendment has been made to the EU treaties to permit the ESM treaty. Because the ESM treaty uh, was, um, as I said, implemented on the basis of, of this uh, amendment to Article 136 uh, which says the member states of the, Euro, of the Eurozone may set up a stability makers if needed for the Euro area as a whole. And yet, um, uh, as I said earlier, only eight, if eight, the eight bigger Eurozone states um, uh, provide the money, well then the ESM can come into being. How can that be for the Euro area as a whole? If a minority of the Eurozone states, eight of the 17, can, can um, bring into being a treaty, um, how can that be for the Euro area as a whole, even though the permission that they're being given by the EU, by the amendment of the EU treaty says uh, you, you may, the Euro, Euro zone states may set up a stability mechanism if, if needed to safeguard the stability of the Euro area as a whole. That's the, that's the amendment. So uh, this, this amendment was made uh, under under a special provision of the a special addition to the EU treaties that was permitted by the Lisbon Treaty, the Lisbon Treaty of 2009, which of course incorporated the EU Constitution, uh, virtually 100 percent, allowed amendments to be made to the EU treaties by decision of the European Council of Prime Ministers and Presidents, as long as they don't add to the powers of the EU. That was an important. Previously, any amendment that you treat as in order to have them, you had to call an intergovernmental conference. You had to have a, you know, and then the result, uh, uh, the proceedings of that intergovernmental conference should be put into a treaty, and then the treaty went around for ratification by all the member states, like the Lisbon Treaty, the Maastricht Treaty, the Amsterdam Treaty, the Nice Treaty, and so on. That's the traditional method of amending EU treaties. But there's a new simplified amendment procedure which was adopted by the Lisbon Treaty and by the EU Constitution, which allows, uh, which is supposed to cater for minor technical amendments, small things, tidying up operations, so to speak, which didn't require a, an elaborate inter calling an intergovernmental conference. This can be done by the European Council, that is the Prime Minister and Presidents, who become an EU institution for the first time on the Lisbon Treaty. <coughs> Previously, the European Council, Prime Minister and Presidents, was outside the, uh, the structure of the EU treaties.
but under the Lisbon Treaty, as I'm sure some of you know, the EU constitution, as the Lisbon Treaty effectively is, the European Council of Prime Ministers and President becomes an EU institution for the first time, like the Commission, the Council of Ministers, the Court, the Parliament, the EU European Council of Prime Ministers and Presidents is now an EU institution, and it can amend by decision, a decision of themselves, to, to, do, to amend the treaties, as long as it doesn't increase the powers of the EU as a whole, without having a, you know, intergovernmental conference or anything to draw much attention to it. And the amendment to Article 136, which allows the member states of the Eurozone to set up a stability mechanism, uh, was taken under the so-called simplified amendment procedure. And uh, one of the arguments of the Pringle, of Mr. Pringle and his legal team is that, you know, that the simplified amendment procedure was meant for you know, not too important technical or minor amendments, the EU treaties. It wasn't meant for this very fundamental, important new departure, the setting up of a civility mechanism for the Eurozone, which will be built on other treaties as time goes on, in, in, with the aim of bringing about President Sarkozy's federation for the Eurozone, confederation for the rest of the EU. A very important development, which has already been built upon, or being implicitly built upon, or being talked about building on, through the talk about the banking union, the fiscal union, the political union for the Eurozone. So is not that appropriate? Should not that be done by a proper intergovernmental conference? This is one of the uh, contentions or claims of Mr. Pringle that the mode of amendment uh, or the wrong mode of amendment. If you want, you can amend the treaties, set up a, uh, a permanent stability mechanism, but it should be done in the proper way, not in this way. That's a second issue, and that was the second question put to the um, European Court of Justice by the Irish Supreme Court. And the third question was, all right, if, 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 if you agree that the ESF treaty is legal under EU law and has, uh, to what extent, uh, is the permission from the, from the EU as a whole needed to set up the ESM treaty? And now, in other words, if the decision of the European Council to amend the treaties to allow a civilian mechanism, which was, the original decision was taken last March, March last year, but doesn't come to force until next January. It says in the decision, from January 2013, um, an ESM may be set up, uh, but, but uh, implicitly it has, to be, it has to wait till next January. How then can we set up an ESM treaty before that? Or does one depend on the other? Does the ESF treaty among the Eurozone states, among the 17 states using the Euro, require an amendment to the EU treaties as a whole? Does, it, does one depend on the other? Very important question. That was the question originally came from the Irish High Court and that we passed on to the EU, EU Court of Justice. So the EU Court of Justice, well, they're basically faced the job. Are they going to go along with this, um, with this development of uh, closer integration on the base of the inner core, the, the, the Eurozone? And, and, you know, the separation between the, the, the 17 and the, and the 27. Because implicitly it affects also their own power, and the power of the Commission. You know, and there are all sorts of, the clear, clear, the clear evidence the European Council, Prime Minister and President is, getting, is taking more and more of the key decisions. You know, and, and those who, who have wanted to, EU integration in the past, or who, who have seen the EU as a whole integrating the Commission and the Parliament and the, of the Council of, and, and, the, and the Court of Justice have seen that as taking place among all of the EU states and not just for an inner group. There's also some talk these days about a special assembly, a special subdivision of the European Parliament for the Eurozone. So you have this uh, beginning of a process whereby the EU institutions might divide between the, uh, the, you know, those for the Eurozone and, 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 that, and, that, and that for the, for, for the rest of the EU. Or, and, and those are questions which are already been put implicitly in the Pringle, but these referrals by the Irish Supreme Court to the EU Court of Justice. So that, that's quite, these are quite important developments. I have no idea how the, how the EU Court of Justice will decide. Uh, and, you know, you know, I have no great faith in the EU Court of Justice. On the other hand, they are they're confronted with very basic issues about the constitutionality, uh, uh, the legality of the EU treaties, of the real legality. Uh, most people who look at the thing objectively are lawyers and experts say that they've been running co coach and, a legal coach and horses to the EU treaties in order to deal with the crisis of the Eurozone. Because the original rules were not kept, the 3% and 6% rules were not kept. They were, the, 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 the logical 
basis for a ban on bailouts was abandoned, and now then they had the huge deficits, and now to find a way around the treaties and find a way around the ban on bailouts, they're trying to use this mechanism of the ESM treaty for the Eurozone. So it's very questionable in EU law. But of course, if the EU Court of Justice found it was illegal, it would it would uh, come to the end of the ESM treaty. But even if the ESM treaty is found to be okay and goes ahead, the big issue, of course, is whether there's enough money in it. Most people think that. Uh, that uh, the crisis is now extending to Spain and to Italy, and uh, that uh, the funds are not just going to be sufficient to, to, to deal with the matter, and that the crisis, in other words, will continue because it's it's rooted in the in in, in the objective circumstances of the, of, of of those institutions. Thank you very much.